See, I married me powerful, ugly creature. How can you say that? How can you shame me in front of new people? There aren't many stories like Firefly. It might not seem that way at first. My invocation of cowboys in space actually isn't entirely uncommon either before or after Firefly. But once you start opening up the realities of what this world is invoking, what it's saying, you actually have something quite unexpected to grapple with. Hmm. Huh. The world of Firefly has the two best qualities you can have in a fictional universe. It is intuitively understandable the first time you watch it, and it has some fun details for repeat viewings. The original Star Wars has some similar positives. You don't need nerds explaining the Horus heresy to understand that these are space fascists. Literal dogs understand that this is a bad dude. Until I have more information, I'm gonna side with the hippie space wizards who don't seem to be fascists. But if you want more info, and you'll never believe this, I have in fact heard rumors, whispers, of an extended universe in which you may in fact learn more about Star Wars wars beyond the films. I know, I'm as shocked as you are. Anyway, Firefly has Civil War era weaponry, clothes, we've got a bloody war for unification, romanticized Wild West era gunfights, and our heroes have southern accents. Thought you were leaving anyhow. Wait a minute. Southern, wait. Wait a minute. Wait a minute! No, 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 It's not at all what you think! Okay, see, this is where our space cowboys get complicated. Let's tread carefully from this point. The protagonists of the show were fighting for the losing side. Is this show a romanticization of the American Confederacy? To understand Firefly's politics, which are interesting, you have to focus in on this question. Firefly has a whole lot of political purpose to itself, a huge amount, actually, and if I don't get this sorted out, everything I say after this point is gonna seem like contradictory nonsense. Um, I'm lost. Uh, I'm angry. And I'm armed. So. And the world of Firefly is goofy enough to make the genre setting far subtler than I'm making it sound. Western genre films haven't been mainstream for decades, and while they would often have Civil War veterans, you'd be forgiven for thinking this show was purely about the wild, wild west. I'm going to simplify this a lot, because every moment I talk about the Civil War, or as us learned men call it, Bleeding Kansas 2, Electric Boogaloo, The National Tour, I'm not talking about cowboys in space. And what kind of host would I be if I did that? There's no denying that, aesthetically, the protagonists of Firefly are inspired by Southerners after a Civil War. The writers have said this several times times. I'm not sure if other countries are going to get this, but this is a pretty intense decision, immediately. See, the American Civil War doesn't sit comfortably in the past of America. It hugely informs modern politics. If Pearl Harbor happened 4,000 years ago, this sometimes feels like it happened yesterday. We don't often tell stories about this war because it's not a heroic moment in our history. It killed an enormous amount of our total population, and we weren't fighting another nation, we were fighting ourselves. It split the nation in half in ways that are felt generations later, and the writings of our southern states explaining the reasons for secession plainly detail the difficult, troubling assumptions of our ancestors, from the cornerstone speech to the declaration of causes of seceding states. At worst, this was the nation imploding internally, and at best, even if you understand this war as a victory that provided a completion to the humanitarian goals of abolitionists, this was still only the beginning. It would be a hundred years before even Martin Luther King Jr. It was very bad for a long time. Now this got pretty historical, and I know what you're thinking. Where did the space cowboys go? Here we go, they're back on screen, don't worry. We've done our homework, and now we can play outside. Metaphorically, don't actually go outside. People revisiting Firefly Now may wonder whether a show released in 2002 is participating in a surprisingly common practice of romanticizing this historical faction. And when I say common practice, I don't mean Gone with the Wind, I mean the Muppet show. So let's address this. Vague genre set dressing like this can be useful for understanding a fictional situation quickly. Tolkien may not have liked historical illusion, but we know exactly what illustrator Alan Lee was doing with these orcs. Pickle hat, got it. However, genre aesthetics are, by definition, not the final word on morality. See, whether or not your characters are literally called stormtroopers, fascists are determined by their actions rather than their clothes. I'm not shallow, I don't hate the Empire because they dress like this. It's because they kill civilians, and Darth Vader chokes people who bring him bad news. Boo. Considering this, I've rewatched the show and carefully compiled a full list of everything the Firefly Rebels, the Brown Coat movement, and the historical Confederate States of America have in common. And that's the list. The show never really goes into the politics of the war, but the show heavily suggests that Malcolm Reynolds is the ultimate brown coat, someone who truly believed in their cause. Seems odd you name your ship after a battle you're on the wrong side of. May have been the losing side. Still not convinced it was a wrong one. Unless we were to see some evidence of some planned later season arc in which Malcolm were to grapple with his differences from the brown coats, we must assume that Malcolm and the brown coats are synonymous. By this metric, we have a simple conclusion. The brown coats are kind of the ideological opposite of the American Confederacy. I say this because Malcolm Reynolds is one of the most libertarian characters in fiction, and that doesn't mesh at all with the genre metaphor that suggests he fought for the Confederate States of America. Say what you will about libertarians, thank you I will, but the Confederacy was many things, basically none of them were libertarian. But let's get our terms in order. What do I mean by libertarian? They don't like the government trying to do things. 
No, but really, in theory, libertarians are invested in personal liberty more than anything else. They don't like or trust intervention in their personal affairs, at least by the government. I think that all government is a waste of taxpayer money. I'm definitely a libertarian. Consenting adults want what they want. And if I'm not supplying it, they will get it somewhere else. Government commandeering your ship, telling you where to go? That's what governments are for, getting a man's way. My idea of a perfect government is one guy, and the only thing he's allowed to decide is who to nuke. This is a vast oversimplification, so don't put too much weight on it. And like every political descriptor, it changes from person to person. It's a caricature of what is a complex political movement that has had many books, leaders changes, and blah, 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 blah. Just keep in mind that phrases like all taxation is theft are popular extreme libertarian positions. So consider that a starting point. And you might be wondering, how does this differ from the belief of anarchists? Oops, my anarchy symbol. Why have libertarians become associated with the political conservatives? How do they feel about economic, religious, and cultural imposition on personal liberties? How do you pronounce this woman's name? Those are some good questions. If you want to find out more, I'd recommend putting on your hazmat suit and visiting what's left of a library. They were these repositories of knowledge before the government withdrew funding. Now, even by this weak definition, the Confederate States of America were not libertarian. Like, not even a little. D minus. It was a government founded when the practice of enslaving human beings was threatened to become not legally enforced. You can't understand the Confederacy as libertarian without considering human beings as a form of property, which contradicts the human rights emphasis against the state. It suspended habeas corpus immediately and jailed political prisoners without trial. It required a domestic passport system to travel anywhere. It conscripted. It... it this is a short-lived wartime government. These space cowboys, in direct opposition to all this, believe in individual freedoms in a blunt and simple way. And don't you ever stand for that sort of thing. Someone ever tries to kill you, you try to kill them right back. See, as such, Firefly manifests as an unexpected love letter to libertarian ideology, like the original V for Vendetta is to political anarchy, or Home Alone is to defensive habitation law. It just can't get enough of it. Honestly, I wish there were more stories that chose political stances and adopted them as a central theme in their world building. In a world of repetition, unexpected love letters to political ideologies like Fury Road is to matriarchal rebuilding are really interesting. And you don't have to agree at all with what it's romanticizing, but it can be incredibly informative and entertaining. <laughs> I mean, of course there should be limits, be responsible about it, but aren't you at least kind of interested in seeing a monarchic comedy, an isolationist noir, an oligarchic rom-com, a libertarian space cowboy show? I'm not claiming this was intentional, but for shows about spaceship crews, Firefly manifests as the anti-Star Trek in political terms. Star Trek tells of an enormous, well-crafted government ship. Serenity is a small, cozy ship falling apart. These are well-trained government operatives. This is a rough-and-tumble gang with Jane in it. This is a glorious federal utopia. This is a federally enforced dystopia. They have entirely different political perspectives. For the most part, the Alliance government, the winning side of the war, isn't a cackling evil force. Their outfits aren't intimidating or wicked. They're boring. Like comically, intentionally boring. Look at them! The government here isn't really malicious. They're mostly just indifferent and bureaucratic. They've got better things to do. So do we. All right, obviously the experiments in River and the giant hidden war crime revealed in the movie are both, you know, evil. But for 95% of their screen time, it's just guys like this being irritating. It's not so much malicious, intimidating villain and more dad and mom aren't home that much and don't understand us. They are wonderfully boring. Notice how the show has a consistently shaky camera, a handy cam footage invoking a more rugged life. However, when we go see what the Alliance are doing, the viewpoint is suddenly lifeless and still, uninterested in what it's viewing. It's such a contrast because usually the camera has a great sense of humor I appreciate a lot. But whenever you see the space bureaucrats, the camera has died. Also, notice how our fearless captain always knows how to handle everything better than the meddling government. As much as the brown coats aren't the Confederacy, the Alliance aren't the historical union. The Alliance in the show is a big dumb government with various levels of autocracy. It's also pretty vague. They might have a monarchy. I'd sure love to find a brand new compression cloth for this. Yes, steamer. I'd like to be the king of all and didn't even wear a shiny hat. Or a technocracy, or there seems to be a parliament? I don't know. It's incredibly not important. They are straw men created by a libertarian political ideology to play with. Their job isn't even to serve as the central antagonist for most of the episodes, it's mostly to bolster the political position of our hero. Hans, Bobby, I'm your white knight. Show these Californians who's boss, John McClane! Again, you don't have to agree to appreciate the fantasy of this. The series creator Joss Whedon is all for government intervention, and intentionally created a character he disagreed with. But a libertarian worldview, by definition, is so indulgent and fun to play with when combined with a space western. You can't tell me what to do, dad! I mean, 
government. My point is that if this were aiming to just be a story about rebels, it would have been far easier to make the government evil. There are endless stories about the government being good or bad, but there are very few that portray them as incompetent. That's closer to a broader libertarian mindset. Shouldn't we report this? To who? Alliance? Right. They're gonna run right out here, lickety-split, make sure these taxpayers are okay. And we'll have to. And again, I've been trying to be absolutely sure, but the most I can connect the Alliance and the American Union is the term Purple Belly, which is a slight nod to the term for Union soldiers, Blue Belly. Blue Bellies will give you a better burial than I can. This video required a lot of research. Alright, superfans, there's exactly one direct named reference to the American Civil War in the entire show, and it's a really interesting one. Can you name it? You have 10 seconds. I lied. The answer is Jubal Early. The historical Jubal Early was a vicious white supremacist, but I repeat myself, a cartoon of a man who somehow distinguished himself from the rest of the Confederate generals for his villainy. The show uses his name for a deranged and cruel bounty hunter with no allegiance to anyone but himself. He likes hurting people and attacks the crew for money. The application of this name to this character, the violent living embodiment of a human rights violation that Malcolm gets to literally expel from his ship, is about as clear a message as can be made on the writer's feelings towards the historical Confederate States of America and Early's legacy. The show makes a point of doing this, and punching slavers in the face. A lot. It's so insistent that it's actually kind of defensive, which I honestly appreciate. The sheer weight of the inheritance of Firefly's influences are not something to take lightly. See, the show romanticizes American Southern culture, Western genre films, and the most hilariously adolescent libertarianism imaginable, which to me is hopefully not synonymous with the four-year Confederate rebellion, despite the show acknowledging the influence. Oh, I get it. The German guy, Mr. Scar, must be the bad guy. As a final note, I really must say, one has to consider what it must be like for the ghost of Jubal Early, a militant white supremacist, to be played by an actor who is... Well, no use beating around the bush, significantly more handsome than he was. <laughs> Alright, we're done with that. Firefly is more than just its wartime history. The framework of Firefly is pretty solid. It's also surprisingly playful. It has a lot of different influences in its world building, making it a more interesting cultural future than just a run-of-the-mill western. There's a lot of eastern inspiration in everything. A lot of crowd shots are filled with interesting little influences. In this future, everything is kind of melted together in a way that isn't really addressed, but kind of accepted. Inara is a Buddhist, the characters eat with chopsticks, and a lot of the characters swear in Mandarin. I always notice more on rewatches. There's a lot to appreciate. Well, alright, there could have been more Asian cast members. As in, more than zero. I don't know. Anyway, it's interesting that specific cultures aren't associated with poverty like most dystopian world building. If anything, it seems the Eastern world has gained more powerful influence in the West, but that probably isn't intentional and has more to do with it being easier to access Western props and them spending more time on the poor planets in the show. Fun stuff. Alright, the final element of Firefly's world is also something I find pretty complicated. The show has a relationship with its female characters that's difficult to agree on. Because you either only remember it as being better than everything else that was on TV at the time, or you have a lot to say about Joss Whedon's career. I have a lot of positive things to say about the show, but I gotta admit some foibles. It would take a lot of time to properly discuss Whedon's full career. A lot of time. Firefly is a tiny piece of a large puzzle, and you'd require Buffy, Penny, Black Widow, Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman again somehow, and a lot of accounts of Whedon's character to see the patterns and rhythms to all of them. I tried, but Firefly alone isn't really enough to discuss the more important things. You need to bring in more evidence. Look, Firefly is a great example of a really important rule of media. Sometimes, the best and worst thing you can say about something is that it was culturally progressive for its time. It describes an improvement, a subversion, a shift in cultural velocity to a younger generation that doesn't understand what it was building upon. And the conversation shifts away from the positive things it did to who did it and why, what was forced, and who wanted what from it. And describing intention is more difficult to explain than what is visibly on screen. Firefly responded to a world where shows had one or two poorly written female characters. It had kind elements that blew my mind at the time, but honestly feel like such low bars today. Kaylee is a female engineer, and not one person is snarky to her about that. Fantastic. This was the first time I had seen that in a show. Zoe, being a stoic warrior, was also unusual. River is interesting and can kill everyone, and Inara is in charge for many situations. Half the crew are women, and they all have their own lives. They're all doing different things. Far more than the average show at the time. And while the show was a lot of firsts for people, including me, its progressive elements are louder and more performative than they would be today. This is not effortless progress. There's a definite otherness to the female crewmates that asks for a much different criteria than the men. I can't imagine a feminine version of Malcolm or Jane existing in this world, can you? And both sides of the line are great, but there are two sides. And the idea of Inara's work being harmless and not something to make a big fuss over is approved by most crew members and is quite kind for 2002. But Malcolm does find it gross, and as a whole, the positivity feels a little disingenuous. I don't know. The show has a weird relationship with this stuff. 
I think there's a slight agreement with Malcolm's distaste for it because seduction is understood as a weapon. Maybe the show's writers genuinely agree with the rest of the crew that Inara isn't doing anything wrong. But Malcolm's incessant ridiculing, particularly as flirting, that wouldn't exist in a show made later. The best example of this is when Inara has a female client and the show throws itself a little party as to how unexpected it is to show two girls kissing. I was surprised too. What will the church elders think? But it doesn't do anything with it, just some off-screen help and then that's all over. The, the point was lesbians. Did you guys know that this would eventually become a trope? I'm surprised too, you learn something new every day. I suppose it's the job of the current generation to be cruel towards once progressive works of the past, and that's a task I feel I can't avoid doing, and that makes me sad. If I'm being honest, if you were to defend Firefly's female characters, I would offer reasons for criticism. If you were to attack them, I'd defend them a bit. I can't win, at least not without invoking more about Whedon's other works, and in the immortal words of Richard Nixon, because I can't win, I quit. To wrap this part up, Firefly has almost become an interesting piece of retro-futurism. From the diversity of its cast, the agency of its female characters, and its interest in both invoking and subverting the framework of the Civil War and old Hollywood westerns. I hope this all can begin to explain what makes Firefly interesting, beneath the central focus on character and thrilling space heroics. When watching Firefly, consider the fact that few shows have felt so unmoored in time. It doesn't feel like it was written in either the Civil War, the John Wayne 1970s, the early 2000s, or today. It's somewhere between those four. Its various successes and stumbles make it a show that doesn't just feel like a product of its time. It's a writing team intentionally invoking the past and creating a strange and occasionally accurate prediction of the diverse casts of stories made decades later. That sounds like something out of science fiction. So all right, we've put the framework in place. Now it's time for the most important part. From the framework of libertarianism to the cultural world of these characters, what above all else does Firefly value? And what the heck happened? Come on, really, why was it canceled? You never have to be under the heel of nobody ever again. No matter how long the arm of the Alliance might get, we'll just get ourselves a little further. <laughs>